And um, not just because I get gifts. Uh, I do love gifts. It's probably one of my love languages, maybe. Probably, yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> buy me a gift. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, um, no, Christmas has always been one of my favorite holidays because of the unity that I see in families. Like, it's just a time of the year um, that, you know, even if there are things that, you know, differences that families might have at times, it seemingly, uh, during that time of the year as I grew up, I, I acknowledged that those were able to be put aside or even talked through and just the unity of the season and also the giving. The giving was always huge for me. Everyone was just cheerfully giving to one another and it was just an awesome experience. And of course, Jesus. Um, the story of him coming into the world um, always blew my mind as a kid. I was just like, wait a minute. So God became a baby. Wow. Like, blew my mind. Okay, wow. Like, I was just, and so it's such an honor to be able to speak on such a special day. So I want to thank uh, Pastor for giving me this opportunity. And um, I just want to let you guys know that I don't take this lightly. And I'm super excited for all that God has to say to all of us today. Um, if we can start off with prayer, if you guys would bow your heads with me, I would love that. Jesus, we just, we honor you today. Um, we thank you so much for, for choosing to come among us and, and um, choosing to uh, live among us and, and give your life for us. Jesus, we thank you for your humility. We thank you and we honor that today, that your humility and your, your meekness and your, and your willingness to, uh, to do uh, anything to make sure that, you, that we know that you, that you love us and that you want us and that um, to make us yours. We thank you and we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I do want to acknowledge before we get started our awesome youth, they are our live nativity today. I'll get out of the way so y'all can see them. Well, now I'm blocking you guys, but let's give it for them. They're sitting up here and uh, doing an awesome job. Um, so yeah, I want to I want to talk to you guys about Christmas, about well, about Jesus coming and becoming a baby. I know that's what we always talk about whenever we hear a Christmas sermon, but I want to focus on today uh, having a heart of pondering, a heart of pondering. Sometimes in this in in in, in, uh, in our lives, it's easy to uh, get busy. It's easy to get caught up in all kinds of things, you know. Um, you know, like uh, whether it be trying to get the gifts on time, get them wrapped, making sure everyone's covered, uh, having money to buy those gifts, uh, or just in life in general, even outside of the Christmas season, it's super easy to get busy. And uh, not just busy going, going, going physically, but also mentally. You know, our minds, we get to where our minds are always racing from one thing to the next, constantly thinking of the next thing we need to do and the next thing we need to accomplish or the next person that we need to go speak with or greet or at work, the next thing at work that needs to be done. And it's just life, right? Life happens. Sometimes we get caught up in that. And something that, a season of life that I've been in has been a season of pondering things, pondering um, things about my faith, pondering things about my family, pondering just... If I, if I could label this season with one word, it would be that, pondering. And the definition of pondering simply means to think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. What really sticks out to me about this definition is think about something carefully. Have you guys ever um, been like panning for gold? Have you guys, how many of you ever done that? It's pretty, pretty cool. I've never actually done it, but I've seen people do it. And it's like, I remember one time when I was in Alaska, these kids would always take their little, their little pans and go to the beach and, and pan for gold, and the waves would rush in, and the pan would fill up with tons of sand. And, but the, the pan was made to where, um, after shaking it, all that would remain in there is if there was any gold, would be the gold. And... They would sift through it, and it, that's kind of how, I, how, how I, I've come to realize of, what, of the beauty of what pondering can bring to your life with the Lord. Whenever you allow yourself to ponder things with Him in prayer, whenever you allow yourself to uh, not just ponder it long enough to get the answer, like, okay, I don't need to ponder that anymore, but ponder it simply for the sake to know Him more. Even if you have the answer, okay, I know the answer to that, but I'm not pondering because I need an answer. I'm pondering because I like you and I want to be with you. I'm pondering because I want to know you. Whenever you do that, it becomes like that little sifter that the kids used to get gold, and all, 
all life rushes in and comes in and out and in and out. You might end up with a bunch of sand sometimes, but if you shake it long enough, ponder it long enough, you'll begin to see the gold. That's what pondering in prayer to me does. And that's what I've, I've tasted of it in my own life. I've experienced it. And I want you guys to leave today with a heart to want to ponder things with the Lord. Because I believe he has some gold to show you. He has some gold that's in his heart. And there's some gold in the story. This Christmas story. And it's so easy in busyness to, or, or in tradition, to hear this story and be like, oh, I know what that means. Jesus came as a baby. He came to save us, bring us to heaven, or give us, give us eternal life in him, which is totally true, not wrong by any means. It's totally awesome. I'd preach it any day. But I believe that there's even more. I believe that there's an intimacy that God wants us to gain with this story because there's, an, there's, a, there's a knowledge about who God is in this story. There's a revelation of, of his nature and, and, and what he did and, and, and revelation of who he is that's in this story if we just take a moment to ponder it. And so I would ask you guys, as, we, as you guys listen to me, to approach it with a heart, to be willing to ponder with me, to be willing to carefully think about carefully sift through the, the words that are presented, the scriptures that are read with me. If you guys would do that with me. And, and sometimes it's easy to, whenever we hear things that we're familiar with, to be like, oh, yeah, I know, I, hey, I, I can relate. I know what you're saying. Oh, I know where he's going next. Oh, I, I, the next thing he's probably going to talk about is this, because we've heard it so many times. But if we would like children approach the Lord today and be like, hey, I'm here to ponder. If you guys would do that with me. And that's really the main theme of my message tonight, or today. I'm used to preaching on Wednesday nights. Is that you would leave with a heart that is willing to ponder things with the Lord. Many of us come from different backgrounds. Some of us, we only come, we're only able to come to church on, or we only come to church on Christmas. That's not a hate on you. We'd love to see you more. But Maybe you came expecting to hear a good, uplifting message that, you know, this is the time of year whenever you hear it. And uh, these, the, the, thought of, uh, the thought of Jesus coming to the world is a, is a comforting thought, which it is. For some of you, maybe you've been in church your whole life, and this story you've heard a bajillion times. A lot of times. And maybe for you, you're like, okay, maybe, you know, what is he going to say that I haven't heard? which again, not a hate on you at all, but may we approach it like a child as if we've heard it for the first time because I believe Jesus has some amazing things to show us. And if you guys would uh, turn with me to Luke chapter one and it's verses 26 and we're gonna read through verses 38. And then we're going to turn to another passage after that. It says, During the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel, the angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary, or some translations say a, a betrothed girl. She was engaged, living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you, and so you are anointed with great favor. Mary was deeply troubled, troubled over the words of the angel and bewildered over what this may mean for her. But the angel reassured her, saying, Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, but how could this happen? I'm still a virgin. Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness, or the, some translations say, the Holy Spirit will fall upon you, and Almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child born to you will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your aged aunt Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary responded, saying, This is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass. And the angel left her. 
And then, of course, you know, and I'm not going to read it, but in Matthew, it talks about how Joseph was going to, uh, because he was a man of integrity, he didn't want to publicly shame Mary after hearing that, you know, she was with child. So he's going to secretly or privately, you know, divorce her or do, like end it pretty much. And an angel appears to him and, and gives him a vision and dream and, and, and encourages him. And I'm sorry, an angel appears to him and encourages him and uh, he decides to stay. So that's something that, that goes on. And then we read in Luke chapter 2, uh, after the birth of Jesus, Luke chapter 2, verses 19. And this is where I really where I want to focus. Because I believe Mary is a great example in this story of what God wants us to leave with today. It says, but Mary treasured all these things in her heart and often pondered what they meant. Now, there's a lot going on in this story. Whenever, from the time that John the Baptist's birth is foretold to, to his father, Zechariah, all the way to Jesus' birth being foretold, foretold to Mary, to the thing that happened, the instance with Joseph, to Jesus' birth and the wise men, you know, getting the angelic visit, all the way to the wise men and, and, the, and the magi coming to see Jesus and all of them bowing before him. There's a lot going on in this story. And then you have Jerusalem. It says all of Jerusalem was troubled at the news that the king of the Jews had been born. And Herod was troubled. So you have all these different things going on in this story, right? And I, I noticed a theme as I was reading it that kept sticking out to me last night. Yeah, I was reading it last night. Um, um, that's just how I am. I, whenever I'm told, asked to preach, I like to really dive. I want, I want to experience whatever God has. I want to experience it myself before I give it. Because it's like, I want you guys to be able to see in me that it's real because I've already experienced it. Does that make sense? And so this is like huge to me that you guys leave with a desire to ponder things with the Lord, that you guys leave knowing what this, might, what this means. In fact, that's the title of my message, Do You Know What This Means? Because I see that as a theme all throughout this story and in, in, in people's hearts. It's expressed through Mary. It says that she did it. But I see that also in Herod's response. He goes, what is, he was troubled. So I imagine he said, he goes, what does this mean? Does this mean that when this baby gets older, they're going to revolt and, and uh, gather around this so-called king? If he's the king that these people said that, are, that is going to fulfill the prophecy, what does this mean for my, for my reign? Or imagine the wise men, what does this mean? We know about all the prophecies and stuff like, but what does this mean? Joseph, whenever he first hears about Mary being pregnant, what does this mean? Oh, I can't be a part of that. I, I, gotta, I gotta secretly end this, what does this mean? And then his question of what does this mean uh, changes whenever he has an angelic visit. What does this mean now? I've been visited by this angel. You guys see the theme here? Imagine this, I mean, if I was in this story, that'd be what's going through my head. I've been told all these prophecies. You know, Mary, I, I read up on Mary's life. She, uh, as, a, as a girl in Nazareth, and said it was common for young women of that day to be farmers, but also to uh, hear stories of prophecies of the, from the prophets and be taught the law. They didn't necessarily know how to read because that was more for the men that would go to learn, learn the Torah and learn how to read and memorize it. But the women would listen to the stories. And so I would imagine Mary growing up has heard the stories of the prophetic picture of the Messiah to come. And so she's being told by this angel and then she, uh, that, that the Messiah was going to be birthed through her. And then these men come that she does not know, bowing before her newborn baby. If I was her, I would ask, be asking the same question. What does this mean? And I believe we can sit here and ask that same question with a heart of humility. Jesus, what does this mean? What does this story mean? There's so much here, guys. I love how Pastor Kirk said it. It's not just a thought that we give honor to at this time of the year. This is a reality for us. Jesus really came. God really became a man. Wow. Like that's more than just a cool story. Like that is a, is a history changer. He didn't just change history. He totally rewrote it. Jesus becoming a man totally rewrote history. History was going this way and Jesus came in and went this way. Like the devil, like I imagine it, like there's a, there's a term going around for a while among youth that was called thought it was. In fact, when I was in youth, we used it all the time. 
like thought it was. You like you think it was that, but it was actually this. I imagine Jesus doing that to the devil. <laughs> thought it was. Like really, I may look like a baby right now, but you wait. <laughs> you wait till that day on the cross. No, really, but Jesus, God became a man. And I've been thinking about that. There's a song that we've been singing at youth called Emmanuel. Or, um, yeah, Emmanuel. And just the song is centered about how God is with us because he became a man. He's Emmanuel, God with us forever. Wow, it's amazing. So that is the question that is being asked all through the story, I believe. And we, we see it in Mary, and I believe she is the purest example of it. And I believe there's a reason she is highlighted. What I love is it says she doesn't just ponder them, but she treasured them. She treasured these things in her heart, all these things that had happened. She didn't just think about them and be like, okay, that was cool. I'll, I'll, I guess I'll figure out later. It says she treasured them. God's desire for you today is as you hear this story unfold even more, that you would treasure them. You would treasure the idea and the truth that Jesus, that God, the king of all, the creator of all things became a man. Then you would treasure those thoughts. You would treasure the thought that you'd become a man in the form, you'd come in the form of a, of a, of a baby. Talk about humility. That is amazing. You would, you would treasure that. That you would leave treasuring that, but also that you'd be willing to ponder it. You'd be willing to leave here today and go home and have time with him and even jump into a season of pondering things with him. What does this mean? What does this mean? What does it mean for me to be saved? What does it mean for Holy Spirit to be living inside of me? What does it mean for me to be a part of a church body? What does it mean for the blood of Jesus to be shed and applied in heaven on the mercy seat for me? What does it mean for the devil and principalities to be stripped powerless? What does it mean for Jesus to want to be so close to me that he would say, I am going to be in you and you're going to be in me and we're going to be in the Father? What does it mean? But may it start here with the story of this, of this humble babe laying in a manger. What does it mean? What does all this mean? I've said it a lot, but I want this to really be ingrained in your heart. That this would not just be a statement you hear from me today, but it would become an anthem, a prayer in your heart. That you would approach God in this way every single day. God, who are you? What does this mean? That is a prayer of mine that, that has been mine through this season of life, probably for the last year or so. What I love about pondering things with the Lord, like I said earlier, it's not about just getting an answer. Then the, the joy at the end of pondering and finding, like at the end of the thought process, isn't necessarily the answer of having the answer to the question. It's the person you got to ponder it with. And you leave, sure you, might, you, you have the answer then, but you leave knowing Jesus more. He's the one that we ponder it with. See, some people ponder things like Herod. He wasn't pondering it with the Lord. Um, his life didn't go so well. Joseph started off not pondering it with the Lord. And thankfully it changed. Ponder with the Lord. Leave here today. Don't, don't just leave here today with a desire to question everything. That's not what I'm saying. To me, there's a difference between questioning and doubt and pondering and, and meditating on and having a conversation with the Lord. So let's go to my first point here of what we see in this story. Through this, through this story of the Messiah being born and, you know, the whole story unfolds with the angels appearing to the wise men. and angel, There's a lot of angelic appearances in this story which I love. I'm like, I want to have one of those one day. I would imagine I'd be like, Mary be like, it says that she was troubled at the angel's appearance. Like, what does this mean? I'd be like, me and Brooke were actually talking about this morning. Can you imagine sitting in your living room? Suddenly you turn around, there's a big angel there. I'd be scared too. Like, <laughs> oh no. Like, what does this mean? Um, so there's a lot going on in this story. And there's a lot, there, there's, I believe there's, I have four points here, that, that four things that stuck out to me about this story, of what we see of God in this story, of him, of some, some of what he's wanting to reveal about himself to us. But there's so much more. So know that the four things I'm about to tell you or we're about to talk about 
It isn't limited to that. I want you to go and be like, what else is in this about God? See, when we approach scripture to find God, we're able to gain a healthy understanding of what it really is saying. When we approach it to just to get our own opinion, our own answer met, I used to be that guy. I'm like, no, I'm right on this topic. So I would search the Bible and hope, and I would search the translation to back up my view. Oh, that one sounds more like my view. So I'm gonna go with that one. That's just not cool. Why would I ever search the scripture for any other reason than just to simply know him more? So there's so much more here to know than just the four things I'm about to say. First point though, is God is not like us. He came in the form of a baby, guys. Jesus comes in the form of a baby to begin, to begin to destroy the works of the devil and save mankind. I don't know about you guys, or sorry, let me rephrase that. I feel like there's some of us in this room that if we heard that our children and ones that we dearly love were lost and held captive by, let's make sin a person for a moment, this person of sin, we wouldn't come in the form of a baby especially if it was our kids. We'd be busting down that door with a big old gun and be like, give me back my kids. <laughs> or we'd be smacking someone's heads, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if we'd be all humble about it and meek and lowly. And do we see that in this story? I believe we do. I believe if we're not careful though, it's easy to miss that because life happens or, you know, we read scripture without really wanting to know him. We just want to, we want answers so bad. So we'll just take anything we can to back up where we're at, even if it's unhealthy. And that's not a hit on anyone, but I, I just know that's how I've approached scripture before. So I imagine that's been most of us at times. And we begin to project our view of God onto God. Instead of letting, we project an image upon God instead of letting him project his image upon us. And so we begin to shape and be able to begin to have a God that looks a lot like us. Our selfishness. Which I'm not trying to say we're all selfish in this room. I know some amazing, selfless, humble people in this room. I love, I love all of you, but um, I, I wasn't trying to single anyone out. But anyway, my point is this. We may have not responded the same way. But what we see of God here is major humility. And we see that he's not like us. The fact that he would come as a baby in a manger. He didn't come, like even just the fact, like our idea of a king. When you think of an earthly king, a king being born, we may think palace. We may think, you know, all the things that he might need to make sure his birth goes as smoothly as possible. But what we see here is a king that's, being, that's willing to be born into a manger of all places with, uh, near animals. We see here a king that is willing to give up, talk about a throne, give up a throne. He's willing to give up the nearness that he had to God. In fact, in John 17, he prays, Father, restore me back to the place of being one with you that I had with you from the beginning of time, which if he's asking to be restored there, it implies that he left there. I'm not saying that he had any separation from God in the sense of like any less intimacy because I believe he modeled that for us here on earth. But what I am saying is he was not in heaven anymore. He was in a dirty manger. It wasn't like the, the innkeeper that led him to this manger was like, hey, let me sweep that floor for you. I suddenly see that this is the King Messiah. I see it in his eyes. Like, you know what I mean? Like it was dirty. He came lowly and humble. But here's the amazing thing about our God. His strong weapons are not like ours. His humility is a, mass we a weapon of mass destruction for the enemy. It's his humility, being willing to be the servant of all that led him to the cross, that disarmed every power and every principality. What a king we have. And what mystery there is to this term that's called humility. What mystery there is in power there is. See, when we think of humility, if we're not careful, we think that, oh, like that means you're humble and you're willing, you, you bypass. If we don't hold a grudge, we think, oh, so you're going to be a doormat. You're going to let them walk all over you. We'll see what we see in Jesus is 
Humility is not passive. Humility is very aggressive. It's all about the heart in it. Because if your humility is passive, I don't know if it's true humility. Because whenever I've witnessed true humility, it's very active. And that's what we see about our God, that he's not like us. And may we become more like him. We don't need all the stuff to be noticed. What we see in Jesus here is he doesn't need all the stuff. He knew that he was noticed by his father, that he was sent and approved by his father. And he was here on a mission and he started off as a baby. We can't afford to have an attitude like Burger King's motto, have it our way. Jesus didn't come to confirm your way, my way, his way, or their way. He came to establish his way. Here's what I want you all to take away from this point. When we release ourselves of the responsibility to have to have God all figured out and defend our idea of who he is, then we will be able to begin to know him. I know that from experience. I used to always try and figure him out, figure him out. What does this mean? What does this mean? Which is not wrong to question, but my heart in it was just, I needed the answers. I love you, God, but I need these answers. Or I'd be so strong to defend him, even to the point of being judgmental toward my brothers and sisters. Or even cutting down at times. And maybe not with my words, but in my mind. And what it was is I was in love with a God that I had projected in my mind. But when I finally let go, he was able to truly let me, I was able to truly begin to know him in the way that he is. And what's cool is some of the ways that I, 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 I thought I knew about him were actually true. It wasn't what I thought about him was wrong. It was my heart about it was wrong. When we allow ourselves to just let go, it's a big weight to carry to try and feel like you're the one responsible for having God all figured out and trying to show the world like having the answers but like, or being the defender of God. God's reputation isn't at stake. Jesus wasn't on the cross but like, hey, you're bad-mouthing me. You better stop. He, he didn't. He was secure enough to know like, no, no, I, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing, but forgive them. His humility speaks for itself, and he wants you to know him for who he is. And as I'm saying these things, please know I'm not lumping us all into one category. If that's not you, cool. That's awesome. If that's not you, then I encourage you to continue the community that you have with people around you, and let us inspire one another, and let's continue to spur each other on in intimacy with the Lord. But if that is you, know that God, wants to tr God does want to reveal himself to you, but it's through letting go and letting him be the one to show you. Point number two that we see, I believe, from this story is God is faithful. The father is a promise keeper. In Genesis 2, I'm sorry, in Genesis 3 after the fall, we see God tell the devil, he says, a day will come where you will bruise, he will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. And uh, when, every time I've read that, there's uh, typically in most Bibles, there's a footnote that refers to saying, uh, it says that that's referring to a promise of the coming Messiah. The promise started there. And we see God staying faithful to his people Israel all through the history of Israel in the Old Testament. And then we see it come to a conclusion, not conclusion, but it comes really to a climax in the birth of Jesus. And that's why I want you to leave with knowing, or something else I want you to leave with knowing today, God is faithful He's faithful. His promise was Jesus. Jesus was the promise. You're like, well, God's promised me this. God's promised me that, which is awesome. But if you get that or you get this, but you don't know Jesus in the end more, then was your promise really fulfilled? See, God promised me as a young kid that I would be a missionary one, or as a young teenager, I'd be a missionary one day. And I've been on mission trips, but I can tell you that on those mission trips, what the fulfillment really was, was I got to know him more. And what I've realized over my life is every promise given is an invitation to know him deeper. So he's like, hey, I want you to get into worship. I promise you that one day you're going to be leading the masses. The promise fulfilled isn't having the masses, it's having the audience of him. 
If he's promised you that you're going to be a pastor, the promise fulfilled isn't having 20 people follow you on Instagram or a thousand or a thousand in your congregation or 20. It's a promise of having him sit in front of you, listening to your heart because he gave you that. He's the promise fulfilled. And that's what we see in this story. He's not just another man. He's not just another baby. He is the promise fulfilled of the ages. The one that was, the one that is, and the ones to come. Take form in a babe. And he was sitting right in front of Mary's eyes. And I, I can now relate even more to Mary as she ponders, what does this mean? I know I, I'm starting to wrap my head a little bit around the fact that he's the promised Messiah. And he must be the fulfillment of the scriptures that I've heard. But there's something more here. What does this mean? What does his childhood mean? What does his adulthood mean? What does it mean? Wow. Something, a small glimpse we can get is that he's a promise keeper. I believe that's what it means for us today as we look back on this story that God is not like us and that he is a promise keeper. He's a promise keeper. It's so good. Wow. So awesome. I know that August, he loves going to the park. <laughs> he's so cute. I tell him we're going, to, we're going to go to the park, and that kid lights up. He, and it, especially if you tell him, like, hey, after you take your nap, we're going to go to the park. You open the door, and you're like, hey, bud, you have a good nap? Go to the park now? <laughs> First thing off his mouth. Or it's like, all right, buddy, we're going to go after lunch. Now I'll go to the park now. Well, we got to get our lunch first. The whole time during lunch, talking about the park. And it's cool whenever he hears the promise from his dad that he's going to go to the park later. It gives him this anticipation, this excitement. And you think he's excited until you see his face whenever he actually steps foot on that park. His face lights up and he's like, oh, and he runs. Oh, he's running the whole time. But I don't know if my kid ever stops running until he goes to sleep. But um, I love him. But uh, he lights up even more whenever he actually arrives at the, and receives what I promised him. Do you know that God has delivered his promise. He doesn't want us just to live in anticipation. He doesn't want us just to talk about like, Jesus is coming. Hey, do you know Jesus is coming? Wake up from a nap, Jesus is coming. That's a good message. It really is. Preach on that. But he also wants you to know he's brought you to the park. He's delivered on his promise. He's given us his son, and that's changed everything. He's a promise keeper. He's faithful. Our God is faithful. And if you're like, well, he promised me this. I'm not really seeing it come. Well, I promise you, I promise you I can do it because he's not going to let me down. He's not going to make me a liar. I promise you he's going to come through. And the reason he's going to come true, it's true, through is because he's faithful to who he is. He is, his name is faithful and true. And also, I know he wants to know you so bad that he's going to come through. He wants to see it in your eyes whenever you know him in that way through that thing that he's promised you. Does this make sense? So he is faithful. Point three. This is awesome. Oh, when we see God as the promise, we will be content. It's amazing what happens when you flip your notes, your pages on your notes. You're like, oh, there's more. Cool. Um, pastors, y'all can relate, right? You're like, I thought that section was done. Oh, wait, never mind. Uh, no, but for real though, when we see God as the promise, when we let him be the focus, God, if all I get to know is you, if we make that the drive and every ambition that we have in life or the things that we're pursuing that we believe God has called us to, just to simply know him and we let him be the one, we'll truly be content. We won't be like, well, so-and-so's on stage, God, and I'm just still here sitting in the back row, but you promised me 15 years ago that I was going to be leading the masses in worship. See, if we have that attitude that this is the fulfillment of that promise, we won't be content. But when we realize that he's the fulfillment of that promise, we realize that we don't need a stage to lead people. We realize that we lead people simply because we have him. He's the one that draws the people. He's the one that lifts us up. Point three, God is the most giving person of all. Kirk kind of hinted at this a little bit about how giving God is, and it's so true. 
I mean, at first when he said that, I was like, you better not steal my point. You better not. But then he didn't. It's okay. No, God is the most giving person of all. We see that through this story. I mean, think about it. God deposited into Mary the most valuable treasure heaven had to offer. Himself. Whoa. Yeah, I heard Zena. Wow, that's true. I'm right there with you. Wow. The, I'm just going to go with an illustration. How many guys have bank accounts? I, I have some. Yeah, savings, you know. But if that bank account has zero in it, I don't really care if you get my card information. It's zero in it. It's not worth anything to me. It's just an account. It's empty. But the moment I put my money in that account, it becomes valuable. Because I put an investment in there. So let me ask you this. How valuable does God say you are? I mean, think about it. He put himself into Mary. Mary was a bank account with zero. We all were. In fact, we were in the negative. Our value was decreasing. Mankind was going down the toilet, you could say. And he put himself in Mary. Little baby Jesus. But he's still fully God. The God, it wasn't baby God, but in man, y'all know what I'm saying. In, in man form, he was a baby. But the moment that baby was conceived in Mary, the value of heaven was placed inside of her. Every single one of you, God has deposited himself into you. Your worth is something to ponder. But you find out your worth when you begin to ponder who he is. If you sit there and ponder, what am I worth? Huh? How can I gain value to my life? You might be able to find some answers, but you won't truly see it until you begin to ponder. Wow, you're in me. Who are you? And I can imagine Mary, nine months pregnant, or through her pregnancy, from one, you know, first week to the full term, through the ninth month, through the end of that. Wow. Can you imagine the pressure that might be tempted to come? You're carrying God's son, the Messiah of the world. Sure, I'm sure there's a lot of pressure, but can you also, also imagine the pondering she had in her heart of, what value is in me? If this is the Messiah, if this is God's own son, what value must be in me? Are you asking the same question? Are you pondering that? How often do you ponder that? See, when we see who has been given to us, we see our value. God didn't just give you second best. He didn't just say, hey, Gabriel, go down there and live with him. Gabriel's pretty awesome, I'm sure. He was made by God. He didn't just say, hey, I'm going to make you really rich and that will keep you from all harm and danger because you have the best protection system around, the best security system. That would be pretty cool, right? You just randomly wake up one morning, you got a billion dollars in your account and get all that cool high-tech all, all cool high stuff, right? But he didn't do that, though. He didn't do that with Mary. He didn't put her in this best safe place and say, hey, this is going to be an example, like oh, signs of old in the Old Testament where I, I send a pillar of fire and a cloud by day. I'm going to supernaturally provide for you. You're always going to have food given to you from heaven. And he didn't go that route again. He gave something even more value himself. And I'll run that into the ground for the rest of my life because that is what it's about. It's about him. And we know it. But how often do we ponder it? Oh, yeah, bro. Oh, I got the answer, bro. Yeah, I, I understand. Jesus came. He became a man. He's with us. I know that. I've heard it. I was raised with it in Sunday school. Got it. It's much more than just something we know. Have being married to bliss is much more than something of, of just, oh, yeah, I'm married. I know. You don't have to tell me. It's an experience. Marriage is something I ponder daily, too. It's, it's a lot of fun. But you, you know what I'm talking about. We really got to ponder that. 
I'm glad you guys laugh with me. <laughs> All right, point four, and then I got to close. But God creates worship. You might think, like, whoa, 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 dude. Song starts with me. Starts with my mind, right? Yeah, you could say that. That's a good starting point. But I noticed something in the story. When Jesus came on the scene, suddenly there was a lot of worshiping going on. Suddenly, these men that had no idea who Mary and Joseph were, uh, were drawn to this baby by a star and bowed down before him, and he was a baby. They weren't like, a, a baby? Like, are you for real? Like, they, they weren't like, shot. they came with a heart of worship. Because I believe because of their experience with the angel, they had a revelation of knowing who was in front of them. See, when we see who's in front of us, when we see who's been given to us, our response is worship. But he's the center of it. If he's there, worship is happening. Worship was happening in heaven. Worship is happening in heaven. And worship began to happen on earth whenever he was there. Think about that. Jesus was in the manger. Worship happened. God creates worship. And what I mean by create is with him being present, it creates a response in us to give back to him. Because we see him and our response is worship. Does this make sense? A lifestyle of worship is rooted in a lifestyle of being aware of his presence. And one way awareness is produced is by having a heart of pondering. Sometimes with our busyness, it's easy to stop and think for a moment and just ponder. But when we allow ourselves just to take a moment, I'm just going to ponder this with you, Lord. I'm going to ponder who you are. You're going to suddenly become really aware that he's with you. And then as you become he's aware, aware, as you become that he's aware, as you become aware that he's with you, suddenly you're going to find yourself just begin to worship. See, the angels in heaven are saying, holy, holy, holy. It's not because the angels are that good at coming up with songs all on their own. It's because there's a man, a God in front of them that is so holy, their natural response is to declare back to him who he's declaring himself to be. See, worship is our response back to God who he has shown himself to be. My conclusion to not today is this, that Mary treasured all these things in her heart and often pondered what they meant. May we be like Mary. May we treasure the things of God that we see in this story and may we ponder them. May we go back and read more about them and ponder them even more. And as we ponder them, may we get to know him more. May we get to know him more for who he really is. May we get to know him more for being faithful, promise keeper. May we get to know him more as the va true value of heaven and all of creation, the most prized of all, God himself. And may we get to know him more as the, true, as the one that we worship, as the one that creates a heart in us to want to worship him. A heart of pondering is a setup for a lifestyle of wonder and excitement. A heart of pondering is a position of prayer that can so easily be forgotten. A heart of pondering is what will cause us, I'm reading this because I want to get it down to a T, will cause us to discover and understand the beautiful mystery of why Christ became a man. And it will keep us from falling into the hole of been there, heard that, know that. The question, what does this mean? is not a question we continually ask Jesus and ourselves of the, I'm sorry, the question, what does this mean, is to be a question we continually ask Jesus our, and our, ourselves of this beautiful mystery of God becoming man. Yes, God became a man to save us and give us eternal life, but there's a lot there. And it truly is a mystery. And I don't know if it's a mystery that we'll ever fully know until he's in front of us one day. But it is a beautiful mystery. And mysteries are meant to be fun. God sets mysteries in place so that way we will discover them with him. So if you guys would join me in taking the definition of pondering to heart, think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. Which if you guys would take that seriously with me today, that, that posture before God, that heart of prayer before him. And as we have the worship team come up, as we have the ministry team come up, 
I would ask that you guys would join me in that this morning. That we would choose today, God, I'm going to ponder things with you. I'm going to ponder what does this mean? Not only what this story means, but what does this mean that I have you? What does this mean that you want to show me who you are? So if you guys would stand up with me real quick as we go into a time of prayer and ministry, I just want to pray for you guys, for us. Father, I thank you right now for giving us a heart of prayer that ponders things with you. God, I thank you right now that you would remove the pressure of always having to be busy-minded and never just being able to be present. Father, I thank you for creating in us the ability to be present right now where we're at and in the days to come, to be present-minded, and through that, that we would be able to take in each moment and ponder with you who you are. Lord, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, as you guys begin to come up for ministry, if you have prayer for anything at all, I would encourage you to come up. But if you would like to simply begin to seek God, maybe you've been busy, so busy-minded, you, haven't been, you don't know the last time that you were able to actually be present in the moment without all these thoughts just racing in your head. I want to encourage you to come up. So many of us, we want to experience God's presence. But something he, he, he has been showing me over the course of this process of pondering with him is that his presence is found in the present. It takes allowing ourselves to be present. Some of you feel so far from God. Maybe it's because you feel so busy all the time. Maybe you're just so caught up in the busyness of life or the anxieties of what ifs or what nots or what will be. And Jesus is here to say, take a load off, come to me and let's just ponder things together for a moment. Let's be present together for a moment and let's experience my presence together. I would invite you to come up this morning and let us join in this journey of knowing him in a deeper way by being willing to ponder with him and treasure these things with him. Thank you so much.